Thank you, Allison. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, this book, The Great Theft, and uh, I'm going to first uh, give you a sense of why I wrote this book and then the implications it has for our um, time. Uh, I wrote this book uh, uh, now over a decade ago uh, and since then other books uh, have come out or I've written other books. But what uh, what is rather striking is that the, the great theft um, uh, continues to be of perpetual uh, relevance uh, because the the type of issues that it flags and the type of problems that it deals with uh, over the the past decade have become more exasperated and worsened rather than um, reach any type of resolution. Uh, after 9-11, uh, I'm sure some of you will recall, there was a question not just in the mind of non-Muslims, but in the mind of Muslims themselves. Uh, and that is, what type of theological, what type of aqidah, what type of belief system uh, would inspire people to commit great act of violence and especially uh, acts of violence that kill large numbers of people uh, while believing and there is no reason to claim that they did not sincerely believe that they are acting on behalf of Islam. Of course, since then, since 9-11, there have been many terrorist attacks. Uh, many innocent people have been killed. And we should never forget that the very, the, the, the primary victims of terrorist attacks are fellow Muslims, um, statistically. Most of those killed in terrorist attacks um, are Muslims and not non-Muslims. I mean, just witness, for instance, the uh, suicide bomb. The, the sorry, well, it was a suicide bomb. The suicide bombing in a mosque in Sina that killed hundreds of people. Uh, there was a large string of attacks in. Uh, mosques in Iraq and uh, even in, in right before I started writing The Great Theft, uh, the director and producer, uh, Al -Aqad, Mustafa Al Aqad, who was a good friend and who was responsible for two very powerful movies, uh, The Messenger, about the life of the Prophet and Islam, uh, and uh, The Lion of the Desert, the story of Omar Mukhtar, uh, before his uh, death, uh, Mustafa al -Aqad told me that he was raising money to do a film on Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, Saladin. And, uh, but during a visit in Jordan to meet with possible financiers to the film, he was in turn killed in a terrorist attack, in a suicide bombing in a hotel in Jordan. So the cost of certain belief system, a certain belief system that uh, are, I call them puritanical in nature, but in fact, they're not just puritanical. Puritanical is the, the polite word, uh, but extremist and tyrannical in nature. 
uh, absolutist in nature, uh, was exercising a very prohibitive cost. Um, and for me, the most prohibitive cost of all is the defamation that afflicts the reputation of Islam as a faith. Uh, if you are a believer and someone who practices the faith, you care a great deal about what, how this message is, is seen by others, and you, create, you care a great deal how this message is seen by your own children and grandchildren. And you, you care a great deal that your child, when they ask you, why are you a Muslim? That, or why should I be a Muslim, especially children growing up in the West, uh, that your child be able to hold his or her uh, head high as a Muslim, not feel uh, oppressed and broken by their Muslim identity. In many ways, the, I wrote The Great Theft in order to state the rather the obvious. And the obvious, in, to my mind, that as a theologian and as a jurist, that the beauty of Islam cannot be allowed to be sullied and deformed by those who have adopted a belief system that puts very little value on human life. <clears throat> that it is an article of faith that if you are a Muslim, the very idea of surrender to the divine means, by definition, celebrating everything that comes out of the hand of the divine. That everything that God created in creation, with all its plurality and all its diversity, uh, is reason to celebrate and rejoice. And so as Muslims, we have had a very long tradition where we look at the shu'ub and the umam, we look at peoples, and the ikhtilaf, the differences of the alwan and ansana, of ethnicities, races, and tongues, and languages, and religions, we look at all of that as ayatullah, as the manifestations of the richness and wonder, wonderful uh, essence of the divine. And if you lose that perspective, then it becomes, and you adopt a, a fundamentally a, a nihilistic attitude towards creation, in other words, you don't celebrate creation, you rather ignore it and only care about creation to the extent that it affirms your ideological commitments and beliefs. You become a problem. You become a serious problem. You don't become a part, a representative of the tolerant and merciful Islamic message Indeed, you become quite the opposite. Now, let, take a step back, so I'll, just so you know, the, I'm going to just read the, the headings of the great theft so you get a sense of what the book is about. 
So first I start out by talking about Islam and extremism and moderation in the historical moment in which we live, the modern moment. Then I start talking about the roots of the problem, the rise, and early, the rise of early Puritans of the, or extremists. Then the story of contemporary Puritans, Puritans or extremists. <clears throat> then I talk about what all Muslims agree upon. What is in essence what defines the Muslim identity and the Muslim system of belief. Then I move on to God and the purpose of creation. Why do we exist? Why did God create creation? The nature of law and morality in Islam. The nature of the Muslim attitude towards history. And the progression of history to our modern moment. Then I deal with democracy and human rights. Uh, then interacting with non-Muslims and salvation in Islamic theology. Then there's a chapter on jihad, warfare, and terrorism. And finally, a chapter on the nature and role of women in Islamic theology and law. So obviously, it is intended as an introductory book and a basic introductory book, not just for non-Muslims interested in understanding Islam, but an introductory book for Muslims themselves to affirm and remind themselves of what the core of our faith is, what the Islamic message is all about. Now, there's a lot that you could talk about, and as you can see, we can take any of these chapters and we can spend hours uh, unpacking the material in each chapter, but I'm going to focus on a, 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 a sort of a sub-element, mm -hmm. uh, an element that I think is quite critical for uh, our contemporary a moment. There is no question that since the advent of colonialism and since the breakup of the Islamic Caliphate that Muslims have been like, oh, by the way, a lot of colonized people were not the only ones, but we are like other colonized people, people that belong, quote unquote, to the third, third world, or the polite expression, the developing nations, which I'm not quite sure that we're developing. Uh, we, we, we might be consuming what developed nations produce. Uh, you know, we buy Burger King and McDonald's and Starbucks. Uh, uh, they're all over the Muslim world. But the fact that we consume fancy, modern-looking stuff doesn't make us develop. It, it just means we're consumers. So all colonized countries and third world countries, including Muslims, the prevailing, uh, uh, the, the prevailing symptom of the advent of modernity and the dominance of Western civilization is that in all these countries and in all these people, there is a, an anchored and perpetual state of anxiety. Anxiety about everything from self-determination to systems of governance to sense of identity, to our relationship to our past and history. If you take the average Muslim and you put to them these questions of history, of nationalism, of identity, of it, what the fancy word for it is epistemology, uh, 
there is an anxiety that comes from the fact that as human beings, we have witnessed vast changes in technology, in transportation, in communications, in uh, global or order that challenge, that challenge our abilities to relate to our past and to understand our present moment. So, you know, wherever you go in the Muslim world, basic questions, if you ask the average Muslim, what do you think about the Ummah? If they're being entirely honest, they're not sure where the Ummah is, they're not sure what it, the implications of being faithful to the Ummah, they're not sure what does this entail in terms of understanding the past and what it entails in terms of understanding the here and now, and what it entails for tomorrow. If you ask the average Muslims, what is your position on the Khilafah? Again, you, in a room like this, you could get a hundred different opinions. If you ask the average Muslim, what do you believe and what do you feel about jihad? Although it is a core theological element, there's no question. But the average Muslim will be beset by an enormous amount of anxiety as they try to fetter out what jihad means internally and at the same time articulating their beliefs in ways that would not get them into trouble with either their own governments in, in Muslim countries or if they are US citizens, not get them into trouble with the American government or if they're in England, not get them into trouble with the British government and at the same time explaining it to their children and their offspring in ways that would not alienate the children and not make the children being ashamed of Islam and so on and so forth. This, the word for this is, we call it, or I call it, an epistemic anxiety, meaning anxiety about knowledge, anxiety about identity. You take any American kid in the youth group, you take any British kid in their teens, early 20s, you take any Malaysian kid, Egyptian kid, and you can literally see a, 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 a volcanic eruption of anxieties about everything from well, how do I define my relationship to society? How do I define my relationship to upward mobility and aspirational notions? In other words, what should I be in the future? You take anxiety about how do I understand history and so on and so forth. Now, I want to focus about one element of this anxiety that has proved to be disastrous. The first element is that arising out of the colonial experience and response to modernity was a way of addressing anxiety, epistemic anxiety, anxiety about meaning, that believed a school of thought that believes that it and it alone can read the texts, foundational texts of Islam, and understand what the foundational texts of Islam demand, and that doing so privileges it in a unique relationship to the truth. So what does this fancy talk mean? <laughs> well, it means that if, if you, you, many of you, if you remember being raised in the Muslim world or at one time or another have heard this, the mythology that Muslims 
have gone astray from Islam so much so, have become so corrupted that a puritanical group like the Wahhabis, and the, particularly the Wahhabis because of the, the, the fact they came out of Najd, the fact that they occupied the Hijaz, the fact that they had the financial resources to impose their system of belief upon the rest of the Muslim world. This puritanical idea that Muslims all over the world and throughout history could have gone astray and it's as if the only real Muslims were the Muslims of the Salaf, the Prophet and his companions, and maybe the successors, the Tabi'in. And then we jump from this group to the puritanical group of today. So who are the good Muslims? Well, the good Muslims were the early generations and the Puritans of today. Now, add to this was a very dangerous idea, in my opinion that it is only the Wahhabis and their followers who understand Tawheed, monotheism. <laughs> that Muslims throughout history, Muslims through the Umayyad period, through the Abbasid period, through the disintegration of the Khilafah, up to the Ottoman period, have lost sight of what Tawheed means, what belief in one God means. And so what if you look at the literature of the early Wahhabis in, in the 18th century, it focused obsessively on explaining what monotheism means, adopting something called al aqidah al tahawiyah al uh, was a, a, an imam, imam al tahawi He wrote a book called al aqidah al tahawiyah Anyway, I, I know you can get the details in the book, but the Wahhabis co-opted the works of Imam al-Tahawi and co-opted the works of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim by in, what in my view was a corrupt reading of these sources and proclaimed that they and they alone and those who will follow them understand Tawheed which divides into two forms, Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyah I'm not going to get into, you know, unless you're interested what they are. But basically, a mythology that Muslims through generations and centuries have just become corrupt and gone astray, and they need a theological reformation represented by the Wahhabis and the, the schools that, that were offshoots from them um, to once again become true Muslims. Now, the result of this was, as an Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab does, was to point to something like the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Khilafah, and to regularly refer to it in his literature as a Dawla Kufriya, the Kafir dynasty. Or, so all the Ottomans were, and all the Ottomans and their allies were declared to be untrue Muslims and indeed Kuffar, infidels. But not only that, to declare that Sufis and by the way, in the 18th century, the majority of Muslims in the world belonged to Sufi orders. Because Sufism was so well established, Islam spread primarily through Sufi orders. Islam spread to places like Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines and China through Sufism. But the Wahhabis considered Sufism to be a heresy. And so, if you, again you read the literatures of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, all various forms of Sufi orders were declared to be kuffar, as bad as the Dawla Kufriya, the Ottomans. Add to this was the charge of kufr 
upon rationalist, theolo rationalist theologians, uh, sometimes called the Usulis. People, by, so for instance, in the literature of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, scholars like Fakhr al-Din al-Razi is called outright a kafir, an infidel. Now, on top of this, leave alone sects or sectarian theologies like the Shia, whether Shia Zaidiyya or Jafariyya or Ismailiyya, all of them were declared to be Kafirs. Now, you might say, how could this be? How could someone come and say, after 1,300 years of history, that all these other groups of Muslims are Kafirs, and they alone represent the true faith? Well, it could be, and it is, through something that we describe as epistemic arrogance. What is epistemic arrogance? It is reading the text and believing that you and your group alone can understand the text and the divine will to the exclusion of everyone else. In other words, one of the great achievements of Islam, long before the West discovered the concept, was the idea, the liberating idea of tolerance and pluralism. You know, tolerance by John Locke and stuff like that, his book on toleration, comes centuries later. And Europe had to go through a bloody, bloody, horrific civil wars to discover the idea of tolerance. The Hundred Year War between Catholics and Protestants was justified by European historians as the necessary evil, the, the, the blood money, the payment that had to be submitted, given, in order to emerge with the idea of toleration. We Muslims had that idea anchored in our theology centuries before. Centuries before. But through movements like the Wahhabi movements and their predecessors, the Khawarij, and so on, we lost it. So when you compare the theological arguments of groups like ISIS or Daesh, you compare the theological arguments of a Sayyid Qutb from the Ikhwan in Egypt, or, you know, there's a whole story about a clash between him and Hudaybi and he represents one orientation in the Ikhwan. You find this regular thematic that only the first generations were true Muslims. After that, there is just corruption. And that the Wahhabi movement was needed to bring back Muslims to Islam. So many of us grew up with the idea that Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab was a great reformer. Why? Because people in uh, Hijaz were worshipping a tree, which is, by the way, has no historical foundation. It's a myth. And uh, Muslims, what Wahhabism did is bring back Islam to Muslims, which again is a complete myth. But even worse than that is the idea that the text can only be read in a particular way through particular venues and that variety of nuanced manifestations of Allah's will is all bid'ah. Bid'ah wa munkara. Bid'ah, an innovation that is in hellfire and we don't need it and you must exterminate it and you must quash it. Now, think about for a second about the result of this system of, of thought. I am not one of those people who believe that resisting colonialism was wrong. I believe it was right. It's just war. 
And I'm not one of those who believe that resisting occupation is wrong. No, you resist occupation because it's just war. I'm not even one of those who believe that rebelling against an unjust ruler is wrong. Rebellion against an unjust ruler, against a tyrant, is just war. So, you know, you're not going to get me in the category, oh, well, you're a quietist, you're a pacifist. No, I'm not. But I am against the belief that you take the, the, the inevitable diversity in human comprehension of the magnanimous divine will and you say either you comply with my own understanding or you're outside of the fold. Now look at the result of this, not just in, in the terrorist attacks here and there and everywhere, but not just in the rise of extremely gruesome and bloody movements like Qaeda and Daesh, but look at the results in terms of the rise of Islamophobia. If you read the literature of Islamophobes, everything they use against our faith is cherry-picked or cherry-picked from the stories and narratives of Wahhabis. The way they cast the prophet, the way they talk about the prophet. So in other words, they just took it and you know, spinned it back at us. I said, this is your religion. But look at another historical disaster. Muslims built a civilization because they were able to integrate different ethnicities. You want to look at the history of Islam? Arabs were not the creators of the Islamic civilization. It was Arabs plus Persians, plus Indos, Asian Indos, plus Turks and Kurds. The effect of the puritanical theology was to alienate all non-Arab elements away from the mainstream of Islamic history. So Islam became a primarily Arab phenomena in the mind of the world. And Turks <laughs> spinned off on their own margins. So did various Asians. So for instance, Muslim India used to play an integral role in everything from the Hajj to the theological debates in taking place in the heart of the Muslim land to publications on Islamic law and theology and philosophy. But today, there is an actual divorce between Indo-Paps and Arabs. They know very little about each other. And in fact, are hostile to each other. Same can say about Arabs and Persians. Persians have become equaled or equated with Shiism, and Arabs have become equated with proto-Sunniism. Yeah. Add to that that throughout Islamic history, after the conversion of Turkic tribes, Islam consistently benefited from the richness of the Turkic element within the fabric of its history. When you took Turkey out of the equation by rebelling against the Ottomans, A, you helped the colonizers colonize you. You don't have the Ottoman Caliphate anymore. Muslims are killing each other, and then the, the British and French and Dutch colonies came and said, well, cool, kill each other. We'll just take control, be in charge. And these legacies of puritanical Islam live with us till today. The rev Islamic revolution of conquering racism and ethnic divisions has been rolled back. And we Muslims have become some of the most racist and ethnocentric people 
on the face of the earth. And you know what? Islamophobia is coming to bite us in the butt by imposing that same logic on us. We don't work well within our diverse ethnicities anymore. And that is because we have divorced each other since the 18th and 19th century. We know very little about each other. Once upon a time, you could go to Hijaz and you find the Indian orders, the various Indian madrasas represented in the Hijaz. You could find the various Persian madrasas. You could find Hijaz was literally a, 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 a center for Islamic pluralism and diversity. Everyone was represented at Hijaz. You went to Hijaz, you saw a slice of the entire Muslim world. Today, you go to Hijaz, you see a slice of one part of the Muslim world. And that is the people of Nasht, the Wahhabis. I don't like to say Saudis because to name a country after a, after a single family, it's another colonial invention. It's through and through a colonial invention. In fact, there is a very interesting story where Ibn Saud asked the British, what should I name my new country? Should I call it Arabia? And they said, well, no, you call it after yourself. Don't sell yourself short. And as a, as a, as a reward, he's knighted. He's given a knighthood. Those who see the current Saudi government and its incestuous relationship with the Trump administration, study history. Study history. That's not any different. The thing about Puritans is, and Puritanical thinking, is that it, a person could start out a smart Puritan. But because of the epistemic commitment they give, they commit to, the epistemic commitment of the, the individual, they become stupid. They become stupid. Because the, their intelligence only comes from literal reading of the text. Not logic, not philosophy, not history, not sociology. Not legal thinking, not even spiritualism. They lose the very richness that Allah has endowed in all of us. That's the great theft in a nutshell. Thank you. <laughs> Let's start the QA so we okay. don't run too late. Okay. I, I realize uh, most people left, but. Uh, if, if some of you have uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Grace, can I? Oh, awesome! Sorry, I, I hear you. Can Can I have you do the calling? Sure. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Yes. Sir. Do you have a microphone? I think the mic is broken. I'm sorry. Oh, it is. Okay. That's but you fine. Can speak up, raise your voice if you could. Yes, please. If you could give us a tiny idea about the difference between the like you said, okay. just to... Okay, uh, and the, the, this goes back to what is theologians know as an aqidah tahawiyya. Uh, so it predates Wahhabism. But there is a very big difference between uh, the way Wahhabis read al aqidah tahawiyya and what Imam al tahawi who uh, in fact had very well-known Sufi practices uh, meant by it. But basically, it goes as follows. That Tawheed, monotheism, the belief in God, uh, has a core a, and a, what we can call a penumbra, uh, a, an outer limit. In Tawheed al you recognize that Allah is the only God, and you believe in it in, uh, from a theological conviction, conviction that you do that you you, you maintain the, the belief that Iman that Allah is the only God. In Tahrid al that all your actions and behaviors reflect your belief in the one and only God. 
so that you associate no partners with Allah, you don't have, you don't perform shirk, and that you avoid paradoxical situations that would lead to the conclusion that you are a mushrik, that you are associate partners. So if we simplify the notion, at least in the thought of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, Tawheed al is correct belief. Tawheed al is correct practice consistent with the belief. Now, in theory, fine. There's no, you know, we can all agree on this. But the problem, though, is under the category of Tawheed al Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, as, by the way, his brother, Sulaiman wrote a very famous treatise criticizing Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab for the following. Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab considered that there are a variety of statements and actions that would render you a munafiq and a mushrik and therefore outside the fold of the faith. So for instance, if, and, and the, the, the list is, is quite uh, um, uh, law extensive and long. If you reject something that is established by Ijma, uh, if you reject what Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab considered to be Ma'lum min al Din al something that is an essence to the faith, uh, if you associate partners in the form of graven images, so for instance in his treaties, he considers the fact that you like art or that you hang pictures or draw figures of human beings all to be acts of shirk that take you out of the, the fold. If you believe in intercession, uh, uh, in shafa, if you believe in the intercession of Sufi masters, then you're not a Muslim. If you believe that the intercession of dead, so for instance, if you believe that your dead mother or father can intercede on your behalf with Allah, he considered you a non-Muslim, uh, and so on and so forth. So the list became so extensive that it, it, re it reflected into two main things. One is that the practice, especially of the early Wahhabis, very much like ISIS and Daesh, they committed enormous atrocities in Arabia against Dawla Kufriya, so the poor Ottomans, whoever was Turkish, by the way, was, was killed, dispatched. Uh, no, no Turk was considered to be a true Muslim. Uh, even practices like um, if you if you use the sibha, the, the prayer meeting, uh, if you read Quran publicly before prayer at Jummah, you're a kafir. If you uh, call for al-fatiha, so if you publicly say al-fatiha, you're a kafir. Uh, if you celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, you're a kafir. If you celebrate Ashura, you're a kafir. So the list, but it's not just calling you a kafir and leaving you at peace. The, the Wahhabis, whoever was a kafir, was called to repent. Those who did not repent were killed. And the other aspect that it manifested in is that in order to ensure Muslims do not fall into what they consider to be the trap of the Hid al rububiyyah they destroyed all the Athar, all the historical artifacts of the companions and the Tabi'in, the successors. So the historical sites have been destroyed in Mecca, preserved over 1400 years of history by other Muslims, and then these kids come along and they believe that no, we know the truth. All these earlier Muslims erred in not destroying the house of Aisha and not destroying the grave of this Sahabi or that Sahabi and not destroying their own. So the, the, just the offense against historical memory is, is bewildering. And a people who do not respect their history have no future. If you don't respect your history, you have no future. And 
that is the fair, and subhanAllah, the, the mufti of the Ottoman Empire in, in, a, in, a, in a very um, famous essay noted this. He said that I fear for the Khilafah, he was, uh, I fear the, for the Khilafah and I fear the excesses of contemporary Muslims because they do not, they have no regard for the rich history of our forefathers. And he was absolutely right. Look at us today. Next question, please. Yes. yes. Um, um, do you feel, Doctor, that the Puritans and or Ibn Abdul Wahab um, encroached on Allah's job, or in fact took the entire job by killing people or claiming um, uh, to be, you know, not necessarily God, but in the light of man balla idha hidaytum. That's verse 105 of Surah 5. How did this verse possibly relate to to the Puritans taking the job of Allah Is that? Yeah, I mean, the, the verse that... Um, uh, uh, just so everyone knows, the verse uh, means that it, you are not harmed or indeed benefited by the fact that other human beings go astray. In other words, this is a constant theme, by the way, in the Quran. There are numerous Quranic verses that basically say that worry about your own salvation, worry about yourself. And the, the fact that other human beings uh, um, uh, go astray is not your business. And that, that's a consistent theme in the Quran. And in fact, even the Prophet was told uh, that it, it, it's not up to you whether people believe or not. It's up to Allah. And, and it's, a, it's a very consistent theme in Islamic theology. And in fact, in the, in the, in the very early centuries of Islam, it, that theme became central to the birth of Islamic pluralism. And the fact that Muslims, I mean, think about the, the, the number of religious groups, even groups like uh, Nusayris and the groups like Druze and uh, you know, groups that are, that are not part of the Abrahamic tradition. But they say, or the Hindus, or the Buddhists, but they survived under the Islamic tradition for centuries. Of course, in all situations, you know, persecution happens. We can't deny that. But the, the, unlike Europe, they were not cleansed. They were not destroyed. Uh, unlike a, a lot of other parts of the world, where in, uh, as typical of medieval history, you either complied with the, with the belief system of the ruler or you were exterminated. Islam introduced a very revolutionary idea at the time, contrary to, to some of the, the, even the perception, the, the concept of citizenship in the Roman Empire, that difference can be tolerated as long as you do not threaten the order of the state. And because of that, not only theological and religious differences were tolerated, but even the historical sites of Buddhists and Hindus and, and uh, uh, Zoroastrians were preserved intact, or ancient Egyptians preserved intact until they started becoming problem in, in the theology of Wahhabi influenced groups like, like the Taliban and the Khan. I mean, after, you remember the, the blowing up of the Buddha statue by the Taliban? I mean, that Buddha statue existed for centuries during Islamic rule. And as if all these Muslim jurists did not realize that this is an offense against Allah until these Talibanis came along, which is ridiculous. So, but as to, uh, to your, your question, do they usurp the role of God? It, all of us, all of us, have, as Muslims, we have the a core idea of what I call legislative supremacy. 
Meaning that all of us believe that Allah is supreme and that Allah guides us through particular moral laws. But this is balanced with another foundational supreme doctrine in Islam, and that is the doctrine of humility. That so you you believe that if you, you know, if you don't care, that's a problem. But if you care, you believe that what you understand, what you do, is Allah's will, in compliance with Allah's will, but you have the humility to say, I can never equate myself to Allah's truth. Poor me, pure lowly me, works hard to satisfy and fulfill what Allah wants, what God wants, but I will never be so presumptuous as to believe that it is my way or no way. Why? Because, in, especially in Usuri thinking, and also in Sufi thinking, when you do that, you truly associate partners with Allah. The partner becomes you. Because you think that Allah's truth only is manifested through you and nothing else. Now, the artifact, what, what Wahhabis and similar groups do, is that they say, well, the medium, the bridge between me, us, and Allah is the revealed text. And the text has a clear meaning. And if I read the text and it tells me, go south, Everyone can understand that it says go south, and anyone that disagrees with this go south narrative is then a kafir. That, that's a, the, in other words, what the Wahhabis basically do is arrogance towards the text. They believe that they, under, they read the text and they understand the text, and the text tells them to do what they need to do, and it's as simple as that. And either you agree with it or you're out. The truth of the matter is, reasonable minds disagree about what the text says. Because reasonable minds understand that language is a very complex artifact. And that language is anchored in a context and a practice and in intent. So reasonable minds can diverge even on the most clear text. And if you're arrogant, you say, no, it's my understanding or hellfire. If you're humble, you say, I believe I'm right, but Allah, Allah knows best. That's a critical difference. The Allah Alam part was grossly missing in the puritanical movements that contributed to the fall of the Ottoman Empire, to the, the, the rise of ethnocentrism and nationalism and racism and so on. Uh, the, the beautiful moral ethic of humility, which is, by the way, at the core of taqwa, Taqwa, by its nature, it's, it's an idea of humility. Unlike piety, taqwa, the, piety is a poor word for taqwa, because piety could be achieved by ritualistic practice. Taqwa means that essentially it's a humble attitude towards creation. So even when you look at the smallest creature, a, a fly, a, a cockroach, a spider, taqwa makes you realize they have a right to have their own space as Allah's creatures. I can't just destroy them. Yeah, we have a brother here. And then I'll... Uh, so I can thank you, Dr. Paul. Actually, I have two questions. One is, um, do you think, I don't think it's a coincidence that, uh, I mean, you mentioned empiricism that uh, nowadays we're seeing these so-called experts on Islam arise and they're basically scientists 
Richard Dawkins and Harris. And uh, I think a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the uh, hijackers for 9-11 were also engineers, computer scientists. So I feel like there's like a correlation between this sort of dichotomous view of things and then empiricism. And the second question is, you know, you're talking about uh, the, the Muslim world, and you know, I'm a black convert, I've been Muslim for a little over a decade. So my connection with the Muslim world is abstract at best because my ancestors, for all I know, are, they're buried here. And so when I convert to Islam, you know, I'm seeing all of these issues that you speak about. I'm not really sure what to do about it or what can I do about it. Um, and I was just wondering uh, if, what, should, what does one do in, in light of all of this, especially someone in my situ uh, situation. Thank you. We're going to start a revolution tonight. I don't know, when black folks talk about revolutions, we end up dead. Yeah. That's my experience too, believe me. I've lost so many friends. Um, okay, so the first question and then uh, the revolution, inshallah. Will it be televised? Yeah. One of the... the uh, the biggest problem is that um, the, the great minds of Islamic history were great minds because, not because they just read the Quran and Sunnah, but because they understood the epistemology of their age, the knowledge system of their age. So when you, when you actually look at the training of Imams like Ghazali or Jawani, Imam al Hamid Jawani, or uh, of course Ibn Rushd or Ibn Tufayl or Ibn Baja or Abdul Bar, or you know, I, I can just go on, and even someone like Ibn Taymiyyah, they were thoroughly, thoroughly trained in what counted in their age as the premier systems of knowledge. So Ibn Taymiyyah, for instance, wrote an amazing monograph refuting Greek philosophy. You can't write something like that unless you've read an enormous amount of the philosophy of your age. Imam al-Ghazali, Hamid al-Ghazali, in his introduction to Mustafa, it is clear that he has mastered the system of logic and primarily Greek logic, Aristotelian logic at the time, uh, because that, these were the parameters of knowledge systems in their day and age. After colonialism, when colonialism gave a lot of Muslims a, a complex. I mean, one, it installed these puppet rulers uh, to, to rule on behalf of colonialism, and they, they, they basically do whatever their colonial masters want them to do. Um, and you, you, all over the, the Muslim world, you, you, can, you can see this. But there was a mythology born that the way Muslims can emerge out of colonial or, or resist colonial hegemony was to catch up in the sciences. So all types of Muslims were saying, go study medicine, go study engineering, go study physics, chemistry, and so on. Why? So we can then develop our countries and stop being backwards. Add to this is that the nature of foreign occupation, and this is historically throughout comparative societies, deprecates the first thing it deprecates is systems of law and philosophy. Wherever occupation exists, the first thing it goes after is law and philosophy. So what happened all over the Muslim world is that the, if you specialized in law or philosophy, you had no prospects. There were no jobs for you. You, you, you were not even considered cool. You're not marriage material. You're sort of a loser. And winners were people who would go into the military or police or become doctors or engineers. Empiricism. And the job market 
reflected that. In fact, it was engineered to reflect that. But then, a lot of these same minds that became engineers and chemists and physicists and, and doctors, especially medical doctors, who continue to be a problem in the US, by the way, by apologies to medical doctors, believed, fell into the trap of believing that Islam can become an extracurricular hobby. They can do medicine on the side and in their extra time pontificate about Islamic law. They can do medicine on the side and on their extra time pontificate about Islamic philosophy and theology. That is an equation for disaster. And the disaster we, that we're living through now. We raise our children, Baba, Binti, go be a doctor. You know, oh, I'm thinking of studying law. Oh, what, what, what type of living are you going to make? No, you know, I, I want to doctor so I can brag about you in front of my neighbors and friends and so on, or, or be a computer scientist, or be a banker, make money. It, it, we became, because we failed to achieve development, in fact, or political rule in any substantive way, we became all about material wealth as a symbol of self-determination and liberation. It, it fulfills a psychological need. But it's disastrous because we hoard wealth and we spend it on consumption items. We don't donate it like our forefathers to establish educational institutions and develop our systems of law and philosophy. No. We buy cars, we buy homes, we buy furniture. I mean, you cannot be greater losers it is impossible to find something that is more disastrous than this. To be a, an ummah of consumers and service-oriented industries. That's our ummah. Now, about being a black Muslim. One of the biggest failures of Islam in the United States is that it remained an immigrant phenomenon. Islam spread to China, spread to Malaysia, spread to Indonesia, spread to the Philippines, it spread even to the Virgin Islands, Islam spread. In all these occasions, the reason that Islam was sprouted from the natural soil of the place to where it spread was because in its success in gaining native converts. The native converts played a very critical role. That critical role is the symbiosis, the reconciliation, the reconciling between Islamic systems of knowledge and native cultural imperatives. If you come as an immigrant to a culture, and you remain an immigrant, you also remain foreign. The future of Islam in this country, if it has a future, will come from native converts. Put differently, the future is you. It all hangs on your shoulders, no pressure. <laughs> all of the immigrants, including myself, we're a passing phenomenon. <laughs> yeah. It is the native Muslims that will either build a future for this faith or you are looking at, because Islam was, so as an immigrant phenomenon, has been here for over a hundred years. I mean, just travel around the country and see how many places are called Mecca and uh, Beirut and, um, and then you know you read the history of this Jordi Hajji Baba in, in Arizona he used to be famous this was in the 1800s because he had a camel imported to the US and so it, waves of immigrants have come to this country and evaporated and you look at our children and you can see the phenomena of the, diff the, the attrition rate it, it is always native converts that root a religion. And, and that is why when you look at 
Islam in China, which by the way they're under great oppression right now, uh, uh, or uh, Islam in, in uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, you know, uh, they're ethnically indistinct. They're culturally indistinct. And if, and the way when, you, when people try to discredit them is to try to portray them as an immigrant uh, foreigners to a native reality. Um, I cannot, I mean, that is why when, I mean, part of the reason that I, I was, I decided to, to help establish, help Grace and Sharif establish the Usuli Institute is to give space and a forum for converts because without the converts taking the leading role, our boards of centers and, and institutions should be completely uh, habitated by converts, not immigrants. We should have passed the torch to converts a long time ago. Instead, in this Islamic center, I've seen so many converts come and go. They come, and then we find that they have really no place. They're not integrated, and they leave. They disappear. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of humility and self-restraint to pass the torch and to say, you understand this country better, you take the lead, uh, I'll be home, call me if you need me. <laughs> On a lighter note, I, I go to many mosques and after they say, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah, they quote a hadith. Uh, and I put him in a certain category. Every, and it gets worse when they translate it. Yeah. Every innovation is a fad, is something <laughs> useless, and uh, every fad is eventually going to go to hell. Yeah. And so people understand it that you have to follow what the leaders say. You cannot use your mind. And I think. This is a difference that happened to Islamic evolution that at the time of the Renaissance, the, the onset of science, the onset, uh, on, onset of logic and uh, industrial revolution that really start reforming Christianity, uh, Muslim because of colonialism or whatever, uh, they rejected that. The Wahhabis rejected using your mind in any kind of, of activity. So first, what is the origin or, or, or the validity of that hadith and what it meant to be? It cannot be meant to stop your mind and just follow the leaders. Yeah, yeah. Before Dr. Khalid, sir, we're going to take three more questions and then we'll finish with that. If you could just tell, is that okay? Dr. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Then, and then, and then we'll turn more. Okay. So, <laughs> so the first one is pretty easy. Uh, Washington Post had an interview with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, MBS, in which the, um, the report was saying that um, MBS mentioned Saudi funded spread of Wahhabism via investment in mosques and madrasas across the globe were rooted in Cold War because the KSA was asked by the Allies to uh, use its resources to prevent Soviet Union's inroads in Muslim countries. Is that historically accurate? And the second question, in the beginning part of the Great Theft book, there was a part where um, about Wahhabism influence, um, Wahhabism influences our package under the label of neo, what it was, neoliberal, or uh, non-liberal Salafism, and it's disseminated across Muslim countries, including in US. <laughs> So to me, this is similar to like a network of computers infected by malicious software and hackers could get access to it. But instead of computer, it's Muslim minds. So would you be able to suggest some easy to implement or Islamic principles for people who doesn't want to join the revolution, just want to mind their own business, you know, some simple take home, take home principles that will be useful, like an antidote against Wahhabism influenced teachings. Great, uh, two brothers in the, yeah. In, in uh, <clears throat> uh, especially in the third world, there is a political oppression 
not only for certain sections of the Muslims, but in general, oppression of the society. And there are dictatorship in power. Uh, what is the Quranic opinion in terms of a struggle against oppression where there is no other? But there are some people who would say uh, it's Allah who put them in power, so until He takes them off, uh, they don't support the struggle. So, what's your opinion and Quranic idea? Uh, the last question. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Thank you so much for the excellent lecture today. I want, would like to ask you if you could emphasize for us that we have the real Islam is only the one that Muhammad Rasulullah gave us and he teaches. Not We don't have to accept any Imam here or there because they are not the Prophet. If they can bring that this is from the Rasul and prove it, we take it. If they don't, we don't take it. And that Islam also, if you would emphasize that Islam is a true faith. It's different from all other religions in the world. That's a real thing. And we are not here just because my father was Muslim or mother was Muslim, but because Islam is a true faith. That's why we are in Islam. And we have nothing to be ashamed of being in Muslim, whether I'm rich or poor. And uh, Are there questions? You. What's your question? Question. If, if you would emphasize that. Oh, I'll emphasize. Okay. Well, I don't accept Wahhabism as Islam, or Sufism as Islam, or this as ism. I don't accept any isms. Only the one that Muhammad Rasulullah has given us is already in his teachings, original ones, and in the Quran and explanations in his life story. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so many of, of my khutbas, uh in in the center. Um, revolve around the last theme raised by our mother, um, and that is, I see the, the biggest defeat is the defeat of, of um, uh, the inside of, of Muslims, the defeat of the psyche, where, you, uh, where Muslims become obsessed with vindicating the truth of their own religion. Um, you, you cannot define yourself simply as a reaction to the other. Because if you do that, then you surrender the, the ability to, of definition to the other. So if you're basically whatever the other does, I am different. Um, which I often find Muslims that confuse nationalism and national pride with, the, with faith, uh, they often just want Islam to be different than whatever they can define as the other. Usually, you know, whatever they see the West as, and, and they want Islam to be the antithesis of that. That's, for many reasons, that's disastrous. Now, as I say in the great theft, and as I talk about in the great theft, all you need as a Muslim is the five pillars. If you, if you believe in the five pillars of Islam, you can spend your entire lifetime just trying to perfect the five pillars. And how many of us really fast Ramadan the way we're supposed to fast Ramadan? How many of us do our five prayers the way we were supposed to do the five prayers? You can spend your entire lifetime just reflecting on Salah. Leave alone the, the, the Sunnah, the, the, the Sunnah prayers and the, the Nawafil and all of that. So when I find Muslims saying, oh no, no, no yeah, okay, five pillars, give me more, I, I know immediately I have someone who's not humble. Because if you're truly humble, just perfecting the five pillars, internalizing them, I, truly praying as if you stand before Allah five times a day, 
It's transformative. We, yeah, we all do our prayers, but I'll tell you, all, the 99% of the time, for 99% of people, they do their prayers as if they're standing before a wall. Not a wall. Because it transforms your life if you truly achieve the state of divine presence in your salah. If you taste it, it changes you forever. So, that's the first thing about the true faith. Now, you know, all the, the, the other stuff, when people say, oh, you know, to, to have the true faith, I need the miswak, I need to pray with my shoulder touching the other and my toe touching the toe of the next person. These are people who have not absorbed the deep meaning in the five pillars alone. The deep meaning, the sweetness of learning the implications of what it is to fast, and how when you fast, your whole attitude towards material positions transforms, if you truly fast. Not fast in the sense of, oh, you know, don't bother me, I'm fasting, what, what, how much time is left for Maghreb, oh, you know. And then, you know, Maghreb there, you drink and eat and you, you pat your stomach and then watch Musalsals or, you know, Egyptian uh, series and then just bow on a khair, I'll wait for suhoor. That, that's, no, that, that's not what the five pillars are. I'm not saying you're, you're a Kafir, well, obviously not. It's just that you are a struggling Muslim, like the vast majority of us. That, you know, you, it, it, it's astounding because you just if you do nothing but sit there and write the Shahada, you know, thousands of times and reflect on the words as you write them. If you try it, just write the Shahada 500 times on a piece of, in, a, in a notebook and keep reflecting on it. It will transform your life. It, you'll be a different human being. There is a lot to say about that. So, that, that, I mean, the, uh, there is a lot more to say about Tawheed and, and the, the beauty of, of Tawheed. Now, so, a lot of my khutbas, I, I stress for Muslims the essence of their faith, which is anchored in husn, in beauty, and the rejection of kubha, ugliness. As a Muslim, you are supposed to reflect on the beautiful normative values, i.e. normative ethics and morality. As the Prophet ﷺ said, you know the Prophet once he was told about a woman well known in, 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 uh, in Medina, uh, who prayed and fasted incessantly. But she was a horrible neighbor. She yelled at people, cursed at people, and so they went to the Prophet and said, you know, this woman, she's, she, she's an excellent prayer, and you know, she does all her salah, she, she, she does her fasting, she, but she's a nasty person. She yells at her neighbor, she yells at her family, she bothers her neighbor, she throws her dirty water from laundry on, on the neighbors, and he said, there's no good in her prayer or fasting. You want hadith? That's hadith. Now reflect on that. Reflect on the implications of that. If you're not a good human being, if your presence on this earth doesn't make people say, ah, I love him, I love her. What a beautiful human being. There's no good in your salah or your fasting. That's our faith. Regardless of what the Wahhabis wanted to be, that's our religion. Because we take our example from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, with a breath of perfumed air, is a beautiful human being. That's our example. If you're an annoying person, if you are a gossiper, 
if you are a, a, the type of person that spies on others, if you are judgmental and nasty, if you are miserly or arrogant or what, uh, quick to anger, you, you don't follow the sunnah of the Prophet. I don't care how many little rituals you do, you don't follow the Prophet. The, the, the Aisha was asked, how was the Prophet at his home? She said he was constantly in the service of his family. If your presence in your family is not a fresh of breath air, you're constantly helping your wife, you're constantly helping your children, you're constantly being a beautiful human being, you don't follow the sunnah of the Prophet. Why don't we, why isn't, why don't we understand that this is the core of our faith, people? Now, the important issue of bid'ah, it is really quite remarkable because the same tradition has volumes of medieval works written about it. And I'll summarize it to you in the following way. All theologians, with various degrees of sophistication and, and specificity, said there is bid'ah hasana, there is a good bid'ah, and there is a bid'ah sayyah. To give you an example, taking your shoes off before prayer is a bid'ah. But it's a good bid'ah. Having carpeted mosques a carpet, a carpeted mosques, carpets and mosques is a bid'ah, but it's a good bid'ah. Having lanterns light in a mosque, and I'm talking about medieval texts, people, because the, the, the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ didn't have lanterns, but it's a bid'ah hasana, it's a good bid'ah. Removing, the old mosques used to have stalls that when the horses and donkeys pooped, you scoop them and put them in a certain area placed next to the mosque. The decision to remove these poop stalls to about a kilometer away from the mosque and to hire someone to transport the poop from the, around the mosque to special dumps was a bid'ah. But it's a bid'ah hasan. I can sit here and tell you all the bid'ah. It's, it's stupid people are the ones that tell you you can't have a bid'ah. My answer is, are you talking about a good bid'ah or a bad bid'ah? Because if you tell me any bid'ah, I'll tell you everything you're wearing is a bid'ah. Because I'll tell you what, stitched clothes was a bid'ah. Take off your threads. Take off your jeans. Take off your eyeglasses. That's a bid'ah. Take off your dental work. That's a bid'ah. I mean, my God, it drives me nuts. If you have a stint in your heart because you had a heart attack, that's a bid'ah. Let me open your heart and rip her out. People, we cannot solve our problems as Muslims with stupidity. And we cannot allow ourselves to remain hostages of stupid people. Yes. Because I tell you what, there are short people and there are tall people, there are thin people and there are fat people, and there are also smart people and there are stupid people. <laughs> and it is a disaster when stupid people take the leadership in our community. Why? Because they do what I call in my writings pietistic affectations. They perform piety. Before they start their speech, like today, they'll take three minutes of salawat with tasleem ala Muhammad Khatun Nabi and whatever. It's pietistic it's affectations. Get to the point. They either benefit me because time is valuable, either add to my knowledge or shut up. Don't tell me stuff I already know. If you speak, contribute knowledge. Contribute original insight or shut up. 
you, you set the standards for your community. If you come every Sunday and the speaker tells you what you already heard a million times in your life, then you deserve stupidity. You know why? Because you demand, don't demand something better. You don't go out to your leaders and say, either bring people that contribute original insight, or I am not going to invest my time. This takes us to the issue of dictatorship and oppression. Like Imam Kawakibi, the Syrian, famous Syrian jurist, said, there is no greater shirk against Allah equal to despotism. Because it's, it, despotism, he wrote a book that and by the way, has been translated to English recently. It's called Taba al Abad fi Awa'id al Istibdad. Abd al Kawaki. The, the nature of uh, the, the ills of oppression and, and in, in the habits of despotism, it, it sort of, uh, The nature of despots is to teach people not to fear Allah, but to fear them. A despot, by nature, I can't practice my faith without it intermixing with my fear of the government. So, I can't even exercise moral judgment without thinking of what a despotic government might do, do to me or do, my, do to my children. As an Imam Kawakibi said, and before him, year, centuries before him, uh, the, the famous successor, the Zohar, said the nature of despotism is to spread the disease of hypocrisy in the people. Now, it does another thing. It teaches people to put no value on words. The nature of despotism makes people not trust and not rely on words. Kullu kalam. Kullu kalam. We, in our cultures, we are even raised by the idea of, ah, oh, words don't matter. Kalam. Kalam bebelesh. Right? Kalam has no value. There's no value on words. Speech. Well, I'll tell you what. God cre creation was but speech. The first revelation was speech. If you lose the value of speech, you've lost the value of the human being. And so that is what despotism does. Now, I wrote an entire book, and by the way, it's called The Law of Rebellion in Islam, about what Islamic Jews say about rebellion, about overthrowing despot, despots and unjust rulers. Uh, there was a publishing house in Egypt that came and said, we want to translate your book to Arabic. They even paid me 154 guinea pounds for the translation. And then Amrit Dawla banned the translation of the book. So the book has never been translated. It's in English. Why did Amrit Dawla, or they didn't ask for the 155 uh, pounds back, by the way. You know, I offered to give it back to them. I said, ah, I think they were very embarrassed because they really wanted to, to translate the book. Because I document in detail, the jurists that refused to sanction rebellion against unjust rulers and the many jurists who said it is the obligation of Muslims to rebel against unjust rulers. And if you want a full accounting of who's who, get the book. It's extremely detailed, rather tedious and boring because it documents, I read all the madhahib, including the Ja'fari and Zaidi, and Ismaili, and Ibadi, and read everything that exists in manuscripts, published or unpublished. It took me about 10 years to write that book. It's called the Law of, the law of Rebellion in Islam, right? Rebellion in Islamic Law. Rebellion in Islamic Law. 
you know, I, I don't, I, I right. forget the, the, the titles of them. Rebellion and Islamic Laws, published by Cambridge. Um, but even those jurists that refused to sanction rebellion did so because they feared that sanctioning rebellion would lead to a state of anarchy and chaos. In other words, that, and they would always say that unjust rulers, if their rebellion fails, they are merciless in their exaction of punishment. So in other words, it's not that they forbade rebellion because they embraced injustice. They forbade even those who did forbid rebellion. They did so because they feared the unmeasured consequences. The first time, the first time in Islamic history where you have a school of theology that says injustice and despotism is okay with Tawheed are the Wahhabis. They're the first group in Islamic history to say, as long as the ruler does his salah and his fasting, it doesn't matter how unjust they are. They can, even if he tortures, even if he, they, to do so unequivocally were the Wahhabis. And they all relied on a hadith that was long ago rejected by Muslim jurists of all elks that obey the unjust ruler even if he slashes your back and steals your money. that our prophet would say something like that. Celebrate an unjust ruler even if he flogs you and steals your money? Then why did the prophet rebel against the injustice of Mecca? Then you would have just enjoyed the injustice of Mecca and just kept it quiet. And by the way, that hadith was circulated by the Amorites because they didn't want people to join the Alid al al or the, the rebellion of Hussein. So they circulated hadith that said basically, it doesn't matter if the ruler is unjust, just obey them. All jurists rejected the authenticity of this hadith. And then Albani comes in the modern age and tells us, oh no, all these jurists through. 1400 years of Islamic history were wrong. This hadith is authentic. <laughs> How? Allah inspired you and all the others. I don't want to translate this anymore. Give me a friend, I have no problem. Say it again in Arabic. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, basically, means uh, give me your brain and walk barefoot. Meaning, you you have a shoe for a brain. If you give me your brain, you give me your shoe. Yeah, that's, uh, that's I mean, uh, it's up to us if if we. Do you I'm, want? You, you want I'm, some, I'm okay as long as you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to leave promptly at two thirty. Promptly, so. I just need a clarification. Yeah, La, no. Last question, maybe. Taqwa versus piety. You said taqwa is not piety. What do you define taqwa? Okay. Um, piety is as a term is wedded to the puritanical experience in English history. Piety basically was a, a solid focus on a, and, and especially it, it emerged during the, the, the Quaker movement in British history and the Quaker immigration to the US. <laughs> basically piety it focuses on, on the idea of um, ritualism. That if you if you imagine this the the um, the, the uh, uh, string of rituals that you perform in eating and partaking in partaking in the flesh of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and in. Uh, baptismal practices and in accepting a, a form of confessional, performing a form of confessional to attain salvation, 
what piety referred to in English is a person who adheres to all of that. So you, you engage in these ritualistic practices with regularity. Taqwa, as Ibn, Imam Ibn Qayyim says, Haqiqatul Taqwa al-Imsak, that Taqwa, its very nature, is not the performance of acts, but a state of mind. And a state of mind in which you consistently regard the presence of Allah, the presence of God, in all you say and do. So, Imam al-Ghazali in his Ihya says that man Allah, the person who has true taqwa, envisions the reality of Allah being closer to you than your jugular vein. As the Quran says, Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. Another layer, uh, 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 Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, who is a Maliki jurist, says that the truth of taqwa is not that you perform your prayer according to the specification or this of this or that madhab, but you perform prayer as if you're truly standing in the glory of Allah. So he was asked, and this is in his book al Ibar, he was asked, is it possible for someone to pray all the time and fast all the time? But in truth, he has no taqwa. And he said, absolutely. It is possible that you just practice and pray and perform, but it has not penetrated your heart. It has not transformed your spirit. Allah is not all present with you every minute. So even when you talk to your friends, you think, you know, I want to say this. Oh, wait a minute. If Allah hears this, Allah is not going to be pleased with me saying this. I'm not going to say it. That's the talk. You know, in your work, oh, you know, I'm tired. I don't want to do my job. You know, you know, then you think, but Allah is present with me. I've got to do it. Because Allah will hold me responsible if, I pay, if I'm paid for work I didn't perform. So taqwa is, is transformative. It is not a ritualistic performance. Unfortunately, again, the masters of theology of taqwa were not the usulis, it was the sufis. One has to admit that. They were the masters. And when we suddenly came to a day and age in which we were told Sufism is kufr and haram and shirk, I don't want by you know, full disclosure, I don't want to a Sufi tariq, but I am a scholar. I study history. Yes, there were a lot of excesses by Sufi groups, a lot of mistakes, a lot of wrong things, a lot of self-indulgence. But this happened in, in, in by the very nature of civilizational corruption. But that's not the issue. The issue is to look at theological movements throughout Islamic history. I want to say something about this, this whole thing about uh, madrasas and, and, and It, what the question was referring to, it is true that when initially the main interest of England, especially in Arabia, was oil. And the reason Arabia celebrated and supported the Wahhabi Najdis in annexing the Hejaz and controlling the Arabian, the, the vast expanse of Arabia and calling it Saudi, Saudi, 
and the interest in, of Arabia in supporting the groups that established Kuwait and established what is now today the Emirat, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, and so on, by basically giving little land investitures to particular families other than Al Saud. Initially, the main interest of British colonialism was the oil. And as long as you entered into contractual agreements with British oil, primarily, they lent you whatever support, and you could do with your people whatever you want. That, by the way, that attitude still survives. You know, we will support a dictator, the dictator can do whatever they want with their people, as long as they, they protect our interests. That initially was the primary, now in, in, the, in the 40s, American oil companies come in and they demand a cut from British oil companies. Britain eventually also gives a cut to French oil companies, primarily in Africa. So basically, you will, British and Americans will take Arabia, and France has pretty much a free hand in Africa. And you know, we're not just talking about, this is big, big money. I mean, in many ways, the, the Western civilization was built on the, on the oil provided by colonized people. I mean, that's just reality. Because the Western civilization needed an enormous amount of energy. And that energy was provided for colonized people in return for cash. And cash that then they spent buying stuff from the Western civilization. So, you know, it was a win-win for, for the Western civilization in every way. Eventually, it was the rise of the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had oil reserves that allowed it semi-independence from the need for so-called OPEC oil or third world oil. Uh, one of the primary allies in the war against communism and the Soviet Union in particular was the Gulf, were the Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, and at one and at that point Qatar as well. Qatar, of course, then changes. It has a new king. The son overthrows the father, and the son uh, um, has a, a different understanding of of the the interests of his country. But what is a staple is Saudi Oman, and the Emirate, and Bahrain, of course. They are great. They, they're a staple in not just providing energy to the US and secondary Europe, but primarily to, you, to the US and also cooperating in whatever we tell them is necessary to combat the influence of the Soviet Union and communism. Now, there intelligence agencies played a minimal analytical role. In other words, we produced the policies and they simply executed them. If we told them to give weapons to um, the Taliban or, or to, to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, they did. If we, when we told them don't give weapons to rebels in Chechnya, they did. When we told them don't give renewables to, Mus to Muslims in the Philippines, they didn't. When we told them don't give weapons to the Bosnians during the Bosnian genocide, they didn't. A lot of Muslims remember the Bosnian genocide, and we were sitting there saying, why aren't Muslims doing anything? Because they were given an order by their masters, don't help them. But they were also given an order when it comes to Afghanistan, help them. When they were told don't support the rebellion of Muslims in Kashmir, they didn't. Have you ever wondered why Kashmir has never managed to gain any independence? So don't delude yourself 
I mean, I, I, I could get killed, and probably I would be killed for this. Uh, because no one talks about the Gulf countries with absolute honesty. But that's exactly what taqwa does. You don't care. You live in Allah's company. And you rejoice in Allah's will, whatever it is. You're happy with it. The truth is the truth. Look at what happened when Jerusalem was gone. People, you want to talk about the bid'ah? How about the bid'ah of not caring about Jerusalem? Isn't that a bid'ah? How many thousands of Muslims were sacrificed to protect our claim in Jerusalem and in the Sahra and in the Qibba? Masjid al-Quds, Masjid al-Quds, Al-Aqsa. How many? And yet, today, the U.S. changes its, its embassy and nothing. Why? Because the masters told the Gulf countries, the oil countries, don't you dare open your mouth about this. Done. Hope, Allah only helps those who help themselves. And Allah says, Tawasal bil haq, Tawasal bil sabr. You're patient, yes, but patience has to be accompanied with an incessant reclaiming of the truth. If you would speak lies and play politics, and pretend everything is fine because you're afraid, then cross. Then sit at home. Don't worry about the future. But if you speak, speak the truth. And that's the truth. Okay, it's time for me to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, don't know, I know you need to go, but there are a few brothers who want the signature. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then,